You will call the meeting to order. We respectfully, we respectfully acknowledge that the County of Halliburton is located on Treaty 20 Mishi Sogi territory and in the traditional territory of the Mishi Sogi and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams First Treaty, Williams Treaties First Nations. We acknowledge a shared presence of Indigenous nations throughout the area and recognize its original Indigenous inhabitants as the stewards of its lands and waters since time immemorial. Can I have a mover and a seconder to adopt the agenda for today? Moved by Councillor DeVolan and Councillor Roberts. Moved by Councillor DeVolan, seconded by Councillor Roberts, be it resolved that the June 8th, 2022 Halliburton County Committee of the Whole Agenda be approved. All in favor? It's carried. Is there any notice of pecuniary interest or general nature thereof today? Hearing none, we'll move into delegations. Uh, and this morning we have a delegation on waste diversion and we would welcome Peter Hargraves from AMO. Perfect. Um, so thanks. Uh, thanks so much for uh, for having me today. Um, uh, just uh, just as background, uh, Dave Gordon, who is one of the uh, policy advisors at AMO, was supposed to be here, uh, but unfortunately uh, sends his regrets. He couldn't uh, he couldn't make it. Uh, just as background, I'm I'm an independent consultant that's been uh, helping AMO uh, over the last several years with the transition of the blue box. Um, <clears throat> so there may be some questions that I might not be able to answer on behalf of, uh, of AMO. Um, the agenda today is really to sort of walk you through a background of the transition of the box to full producer responsibility. Uh, what you need to be aware of as, as decisions uh, that you'll need to make as part of that transition. Uh, and then obviously to answer any questions that you might have about that transition. Um, wondering if we can pull up the uh, the slide deck, if that's possible. Perfect. And just just move to the uh, next slide. Perfect. Um, so as as background, at the inception of the blue box, the program was always pitched at being a financial boon for municipalities. Municipalities were going to collect lots of paper and lots of uh, metal, and uh, the the value they received from those commodities was meant to be. Uh, a big revenue generator. Uh, this really was never the case. Um, uh, it was always a cost to municipalities. And so over time, the provincial government stepped in and an agreement was reached to uh, provide a shared funding model. So producers of products of uh, packaging would pay roughly half the bill and municipalities would pay the other half and be required to manage uh, recycling programs in their jurisdictions. Over the last two decades, the packaging we consume has become far more diverse and, and, and more difficult to recycle. And as a result, we've seen costs that have continued to grow uh, and performance that has stagnated and then started to decline over the last several years. So the Blue Box program is, uh, has been causing issues for some time. Um, and that really has been a factor uh, based on uh, this sort of shared responsibility between producers and municipalities. I'll generalize and try to summarize some of the arguments. You know, producers were always of the opinion that municipalities were inefficient, they couldn't drive uh, cost reductions, and they weren't managing the systems uh, properly. Municipalities, on the other hand, pointed to uh, producers and said, you know, with an ever-changing stream of, of complex packaging, uh, that confuses consumers, that's difficult to recycle and difficult to plan collection and processing infrastructure. Um, it was really their fault as to why the program wasn't working. So the arguments really between the two, between producers and municipalities was always circular. Um, there was, you know, the system was really stagnated and costs were rising. Um, so in a shared responsibility model, the problem I think that everyone was pointing to is that really nobody was accountable uh, for the system. And so the argument was made over time that one party needed to be accountable and municipalities pushed uh, for producers to be fully responsible. Um, producers really have a greater ability to be able to influence and markets 
Uh, they're the ones manufacturing goods. So they're the ones potentially that can draw materials. They can establish because of economies of scale, much more efficient collection and processing systems. And then they have the ability to design more recyclable products uh, and keep more resources within the, uh, within the economy. Uh, next slide over. So, so this sort of transition and this push uh, uh, for full producer responsibility is not new. Uh, municipal, municipal governments have been working with uh, the province uh, since 2016 uh, when framework legislation was passed. Uh, so we had a couple of sort of starts and stops. We had a failed process between 2017 and 2018. Um, we had a mediation process that was pushed in 2019 and then consultation on an actual regulation between 2020 and 2021. So it has been a fairly long road to get us to where we are today. Uh, next slide over. There still is a relatively long road ahead. Uh, uh, there are lots of activities that are currently underway. So um, municipalities are now scheduled to transition in a, in a sort of staggered manner over the next two and a half year timeline. So from July 1st, 2023 uh, to December 31st of 2025. Uh, over that transition time period, producers are required to ensure that there's a minimum, um, sort of minimum um, a collection requirements that are still in place, that everything is maintained as it is right now. And then in 2026, Producers have to collect a larger range of packaging um, uh, and, and, and products, uh, and that list would be standardized right across the province. They also need to collect from a number of new sources, and uh, they would also uh, be required to meet uh, targets set by the province. Next slide over. So for Har ha uh, Haldeman, uh, or Halliburton County, uh, your local governments are all scheduled to transition in 2024, uh, but there are three different year or three different dates within uh, 2024 when they're scheduled uh, to transition, and that's uh, up on the slide. Next slide over. So just just specifically on the regulation itself, uh, the regulation was finalized in in June of last year. Uh, as I mentioned, producers will now be financially and operationally responsible for uh, uh, collecting uh, blue box materials across the province. The regulation requires service to be maintained during transition. And in 2026, all communities in Ontario must be serviced, all residential dwellings, all schools, all publicly funded retirement and long-term care homes, and they will need to increase the amount of public space uh, recycling that's offered across the province. There are requirements for a standardized and enhanced list of recyclables. Um, so that would include sort of all of the packaging that you are receiving at your households. Uh, they'll need to have, uh, will need to be accepted within the uh, recycling programs. And then as I mentioned again, there are high enforceable material specific targets that will come in into effect in 2026 uh, that will force uh, our producers to do more to uh, collect more material and make sure that the recycling facilities are capturing more of those resources as well. Next slide over. I just want to mention this because we did uh, we did have some last minute amendments that were made to the regulation uh, just before the last provincial election. Um, they were established mainly to address concerns with the legislation to ensure that the timeline happened smoothly. Um, so producers are now required by July of this year to submit a plan as to how they're going to stand up the sort of common collection system across the uh, across the province. There was one additional change I'll also mention uh, that uh, exempted newspapers uh, from responsibility, newspaper publishers from responsibility. And I just wanna be clear about what I mean by that. Newspapers are still required to be collected in blue box programs. It just means that producers are off the hook for costs and, uh, and managing uh, uh, the program. Uh, uh, municipalities have certainly not been supportive of this. It does 
uh, create some concerns within the system. A, it, unfor it fairly puts costs onto other producers and it does potentially dull some of the paper targets. So more difficult to recycle paper products uh, like coffee cups, uh, there may not be as much need to, to try to capture those materials as producers can now use newspapers uh, towards the targets they need to achieve. Next slide over. Not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide, but um, municipal governments did set sort of four key objectives related to transition that has sort of guided all of the conversations that we've had with governments and other key stakeholders. And those were really a to ensure a smooth transition of municipal led uh, uh, servicing to producer led servicing to encourage collective action between the producers and ensure that they are fully accountable um, to provide some protections to ensure that that common collection system is is stable um, and uh, ensure uh, customer service and environmental protection and finally to preserve and enhance competition within the marketplace. Next slide over. And my apologies, this is the third timeline I've shared now, uh, but this just gets into a little bit more detail. Um, so we've just passed the provincial election. Um, um, we just wanna make sure that as you look at, at the timeline ahead, there are a number of pressures that as we move to transition, the first municipalities start to transition 13 months from now, um, there is pressures in that time period. So we do have a municipal election that's gonna happen uh, before uh, those first uh, municipalities start to transition. We also know that there are some fairly uh, uh, extreme issues with supply chain right now that may affect the ability to be able to uh, establish new collection and processing contracts. Uh, as an example, we are hearing right now currently to purchase vehicles and recycling equipment, you can take about a year and a half to actually receive uh, those trucks and equipment. So certainly not ideal when you start to look at, at the current uh, uh, timeline. Uh, a lot of these, the pressure that is in place right now is really was really out of uh, municipal control. It was, it was largely related to uh, some of the lobbying that was going on. Um, but again, something we can't, uh, we, we couldn't control ourselves. As a result, the sort of next period of time, producers are, are pushing for answers as quickly as possible uh, as to what municipal government want to do. Uh, they need to make sure that they can plan and make sure that there are services in place for when all communities begin to uh, transition. So we'll discuss this in a little bit more detail. Uh, but your councils need to start talking about what does transition for your municipalities look like? Do you want to continue to play a role in service provision? Um, do you want to provide some form of delegated authority uh, to your CAO, your city manager or senior management? Uh, should decisions meet, need to be made, especially during that uh, municipal election period? Uh, where it may be difficult for uh, councils to actually make decisions. Next slide over. So Circular Materials Ontario is the largest uh, producer responsibility organization. They're the organization that is largely setting up what this common collection system needs to look like. Um, they are I, as I mentioned, fairly anxious about uh, the servicing that needs to be done to deliver the program. And those uh, municipalities that are transitioning within that first year, so from sort of July 2023 to July 2024, uh, producers have to submit a, a plan by July uh, 1st of this year um, as to what that common collection system, how that common collection system is going to be stood up. So as a result of that, they have released a master service agreement and statements of work uh, for depots, curbside collection, uh, public space collection, and uh, promotion and education. Uh, they've indicated generally that uh, for depot only communities, they would like those uh, municipalities to continue to provide servicing on an ongoing basis. For curbside collection communities, uh, they would like municipalities to continue to provide servicing 
particularly during the transition period from, again, July or whatever date you first tran you're transitioning. So for Halliburton, that would be uh, 2024 uh, to the end of 2025. But then moving, but then they are talking about moving to larger waste catchment areas that go beyond municipal borders uh, and more stringent conditions that might make it difficult for uh, municipalities to agree to. Uh, for the catchment area in, in Halliburton, it does look like they are drawing a line around Halliburton County. So all of your local governments would be included in that larger collection catchment area. The initial contracts they issue pose, I think, a number of concerns that municipal governments need to think through closely. They've included substantial terms and conditions that may not be able to be accommodated in existing contracts. Uh, it's difficult, obviously, to open up existing contracts uh, to add new requirements and conditions. If you do, you're likely going to end up with potentially higher costs uh, for that contract. Uh, the contract methodology that they've been or that they've established within um, these agreements is based off of uh, the sort of 2020 data call. So uh, what you report in currently um, and indexed uh, for inflation and fuel. They've developed a calculator that staff can use to analyze what that, what that uh, compensation might look like compared to current costs. But we have heard from a number of municipalities that the funding that they're proposing does fall short uh, as it doesn't take into account things like uh, newly signed contracts where you may have seen uh, substantial increases since 2020. There are also some financial risks that are built into the contracts that could expose municipalities to penalties and uh, dictate uh, what we are concerned about, about some unfair terms within those contracts. We did uh, write back uh, to this organization uh, as a whole of municipalities um, about our concerns about uh, the initial contracts that were put out. Um, you know, I think the general sentiment we've heard from a number of municipalities is they would like to continue to provide uh, services uh, during this, uh, during particularly the transition period to accommodate uh, contracts they may have in place and to ensure there's a smooth transition. Um, we have heard back uh, from uh, that organization, Circular Materials, and we understand they are in the midst right now of revising their offer, those contracts, uh, and they will be uh, reposting uh, a new uh, new contracts as of uh, June 15th. Next slide over. So just getting into next steps. I mean, I think this is a pretty key decision point for municipalities. Do you want to continue to provide services or do you want to turn those services over to producers and let them manage them on your behalf? Uh, most of your programs right now um, in the county are depot only. Producers have indicated they would like to continue to work with municipalities uh, for servicing um, with those depots. You just really need to make sure that the commercial terms are satisfactory uh, financially, that performance conditions are, are fair, um, and that it doesn't expose you to too much risk. If you cannot agree in those terms, producers are still required to set up a system themselves and ensure your residents are serviced uh, based on the terms uh, set in the regulation. Um, that could involve changes potentially to some of your system. It could mean uh, instead of the depots that are being used right now, it may mean they may need to, need to go to a different location for their blue box materials. Um, so there are some potential changes that could come into place, but the requirement for those producers is to match what garbage garbage collection is within your uh, within your boundaries. I should also note that under the regulation, producers are not responsible to to provide services for non eligible sources. Uh, so uh, this would include uh, things like businesses uh, that you might be servicing or not for profits that you might be servicing within your community. Um, this was the case as part of the Blue Box program plan. You didn't receive any funding uh, for servicing those locations, uh, but it is something you need to be aware of. Uh, you may need to plan uh, for BIAs or small businesses 
or other municipal types of sources like libraries or community centers uh, to find a different way to provide servicing to those locations if you want to continue to provide servicing to those locations. Um, the material you collect from those sources may need to be delineated from residential sources at your depots or you may need to do some regular audits to make sure that you understand what portion is, uh, is residential and what portion is commercial. Um, so we have been having discussions with uh, uh, a number or all uh, local governments about this right now. Uh, and we've been developing materials that uh, municipalities can look to help them uh, in working through some of those issues. Uh, so producers are pushing for decisions uh, around uh, uh, what you plan to do around servicing uh, this summer. Um, even for those transitioning later in the process, they do want indications as, as soon as possible uh, so that if municipalities are no longer willing to provide services, they need to go out and they need to contract out uh, with either the current service provider you have right now or they need to, uh, they need to move forward with uh, RFPs uh, for servicing. So it is a fairly tight timeline uh, uh, to get uh, responses back. Just in the longer term perspective, uh, so post 2026, we would expect uh, that producers will use similar conditions to what's in place currently with the master service agreements and the statements of work. Uh, so they will likely want uh, more conditions to be placed uh, within their contract terms as they want to deal with different types of liabilities that they might see. Um, so the question is really, is really, if you are considering server provision post January 1st, 2026, can you manage or can you accommodate those types of terms? Um, I would suggest, you know, if you are considering that, you and your staff should be pushing producers to better understand those, those future contract terms, pose questions, ensure you understand their approach and ensure you understand or they understand what conditions might be deal breakers for you. Um, and then next slide over. And that's everything. Uh, Dave Gordon's contact information is included there and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Thanks very much um, for that detailed presentation. Sounds to me like the transition is going to be more than a little bit complicated for everybody involved. Um, I look to council for questions or comments. Councillor Moffat and then Councillor Rao. Um, thank you and thank you for the presentation. I hope I don't put you on the spot, but I'm going to assume that, uh, that you have the background knowledge for all of this. Uh, sounds to me um, that the producers are in the driver's seat and that the townships are going to have to make choices and potentially staff and fund them in a very short timeline. Have I understood that correctly? Yes, they're in the driver's seat. They are, they are moving forward. They are financially and operationally responsible for the programs. Um, and um, municipal governments can make their decisions as to whether they want to continue to participate or not. There is no responsibility moving forward to provide recycling services post your transition. Go ahead. So that's, that's my point. And what I, I see to be the problem is that the choices, it's almost like, would you, would you choose hanging or shooting? Like there's, we don't, we're, we're under the gun to make choices in a very short timeline that are going to cost us money. So if the county uh, has a line drawn around it, are we to assume that the county is, the four municipalities and a two-tier government are going to have to get together in a short time frame and create their own depot? No, municipalities will, our producers are required to provide that collection service um, and um, ensure that they've got depots in place or curbside collection in place, depending on your community. But that's my point is if, if the producer decides to have a depot in Halliburton County, then the municipalities have to move materials to that depot in, in theory. So we have four landfills in Algonquin Highlands. I don't think Sony Canada is going to send a truck around to our four landfills to get their television boxes. 
So this is focused on packaging um, and uh, producers will be responsible for that side. So there should be no cost to municipalities moving forward in the sense that producers are responsible to make sure that material is collected to match garbage servicing within your community uh, and provide that servicing. The question for municipalities is, do you want to continue to play a role? And what role, if, if you want to continue to play the role, is that? And, and then there are terms that you need to accept as part of that if you want to continue to play a role. So if you choose not to play a role, producers will need to establish their own depots and collect the material themselves. Now, now that being said, they're not going to want to generally develop new depots on their own. You've got, you know, they're going to want to work with you with the depots that you've got, because quite frankly, it's a lower cost uh, to them to use the depots you currently have in place. Yeah, and I thank you for the clarification, and I'm not trying to be unkind. We don't have any depots. We have in Halliburton County, how many landfills do we have? So you have five, we have four. Like there's... We don't have garbage pickup. We have landfills. So people have to drive their materials to landfills. So it still sounds to me that the producers, if I were a producer and I looked at a place like Halliburton County that had as many landfills sites as we do, I would say, well, we're not going to send a truck trundling around to all these landfills. So for Halliburton County, you have a choice. You can create a depot and have your municipalities bring all your stuff and we'll get it from there. If I were a producer, that's what I would, I would look for. And, and so that makes municipalities then in the middle of a budget year have to make accommodation for uh, start, starting to move these things forward or in, um, adding costs going forward into our full transition dates that we've chosen. I mean, we knew, we knew this was gonna happen but we weren't sure the details. And so we've been wary about the details since this was first uh, established Producer responsibility is, is really important for us, um, but in rural communities that have individual landfills, it tends to be, it looks like it's going to be quite costly and time consuming to be involved in it because, because the producers have the, have the choice. It's, it's my way or the highway for the producers, and they're not going to send a truck around to 12 landfills in one county. So, so, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but I mean, we're on the ground here. I'm not sure where you are, but um, I think rural landfills and the number that we have are a different cat than in other, in other areas. So we have some different thinking to do, I think. Madam Chair, if I could, if I could just ask one question. Um, so currently right now at your landfills, are you collecting um, recyclable material? Yes. Yes, we are, and it gets taken out of the community to the to the nearest um, municipal recycling facility. We've so the producers, that. the producers will need to ma match that servicing. So when I talk about depots, depots can be things that are a standalone, or they can be operations like at a landfill, where you have an area within that landfill face where you are collecting recyclable material. So producers are required to match that same type of service that's being provided on the, on the waste side. So you're collecting waste at a number of different landfills or collection consolidation points. They will be required to do that moving forward to match that servicing. Okay, I'll, I'll just leave it. Okay, hey, Councillor Rael and then Councillor Roberts. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, you know, it's given us a lot of information, both things we can use and questions we can ask. One of the things you mentioned in what you were saying is you said that libraries would be classified as more or less commercial, which leads me to ask the, the next question, which, we, which would be related to rec centers, uh, various other types of, of, of facilities that we have, arenas, and not to mention all of our uh, buildings that we use for administration, would they fall into the same category? And if so, is there any recommendation on how we would handle that? Um, uh, yes, they would all be considered to be uh, 
non-residential sources. Um, they currently right now within the blue box program are considered the same. So you would be paying for hundred percent of those costs currently right now. So they've always been on the sort of outside of that. There are some new requirements within this regulation that require expanded servicing for beverage containers. Uh, so there is going to be likely more collection happening for beverage containers specifically in some of those types of, of facilities that you, you spoke to. So recreation centers, arenas would likely be ideal areas to collect uh, uh, beverage containers. Um, for those other facilities, uh, we are right now um, working on materials and running a number of workshops around how municipalities might deal um, with providing servicing to uh, some of those collection sites moving forward. That might be things like uh, uh, looking at uh, consolidated um, uh, 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 tenders uh, for, for servicing of those, potentially working with other, other local governments in your area to give yourself more of an economy of scale to purchase those materials or to purchase those services. So we are looking at a number of ways. We do know that it is uh, a concern for particularly rural um, and remote municipalities. Uh, we are also having a number of conversations. British Columbia has gone through this as well. They have had similar types of issues. So we are working with British Columbia as well, municipalities in British Columbia, uh, to talk through some of these issues and look about providing a device to municipalities like yourselves uh, to... Uh, uh, to find solutions moving forward. Go ahead. So if, if I understand you correctly, are you saying that the materials from those facilities would have to be segregated from the residential ones into separate containers? And if that's the case, we're talking about volume in terms and, and area to, to, for like those containers. Uh, is, is, that's the challenge we're gonna have to deal with, I'm assuming. Correct. Councilor Roberts, and then I believe Councilor Devolin. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks again for your presentation. I just, I, I know probably to County Council um, that I think when we get to the service delivery review uh, meeting this afternoon, which I sent my regrets, I'm sorry, but our, um, I think our, uh, all the lower tier waste management uh, staff will be in on that and that'll be quite lively conversation. They know what's happening and they may have some more thoughts onto the logistics of libraries or community centers or all of that. So that's a comment to, to hold a lot of probably our questions back to our municipal staff on that and the working group that we have this afternoon. And the question is, um, one of the most successful recycling programs is the LCBO return because 10 cents on a bottle of beer doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you have a cartload, it adds up. And so that's become a very, you know, worldwide successful recycling program. And I've been to several conferences where there has been a push and a lineup of municipal um, uh, elected officials who are, were pushing for a recycling program that charged 10 cents on a bottle of pop and so particularly pop and soda and uh, single beverage uh, drinks. And I know that that would be complicated because where would somebody collect them, but other provinces do it across Canada. Um, Newfoundland for one, I know for sure. And I think there's a few out West and the producers bucked that because it was too much work. So is there any talk at AMO about ensuring that, I know it means a separate depot collection, but that's, that's a sidebar. Is there any talk at all at AMO about pushing producers to do the, what is it called the deposit system? So there certainly has been. Uh, um, the beverage industry specifically has been quite forceful in pushing against it. That is changing to some extent um, um, globally. You're seeing some of the large beverage companies start to change their positions, particularly uh, the result of uh, federal governments uh, coming uh, and, and uh, the European Union coming forward with recycle content mandates. So if the, you need to have, uh, you know, 40% of, of beverage containers uh, with recycle content, you've got to have that material that's available to you. And so that is pushing a lot of jurisdictions um, towards 
deposit return because you collect clean streams of material um, and and it becomes a supply of that material for 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 the beverage industry so that shift is starting to happen uh, i think the thinking always around uh, this uh, approach producer responsibility was if you set the targets high enough um, th that producers really probably wouldn't have many other ways to go other than to look at uh, deposit return types of systems. So I think there is still an ongoing conversation within the beverage industry about whether they can actually achieve the targets set within the, uh, the regulation um, by just simply adding an additional public space recycling. Um, there is some indication that potentially they may have been better to go directly to a deposit system. Um, so that conversation is always ongoing within, within AMO. I know we have an, a number of, uh, of members that have pushed quite forcefully for it, uh, but up until now, the appetite within government and within certainly some of those st other stakeholder groups has been uh, weak. And just to follow up, thank you for that. And I, you know, I, I hope uh, councils and, and municipalities continue to push for that because I think it really is a successful program. There's incentive. And one of the things we talked about where our area is rural. So, um, and, you know, we all have garbage cans on our main street or we have events in our parks and that type of thing. And we try very hard to put, you know, this is garbage and this is your recycling. And it always ends up getting contaminated. Uh, garbage goes in the recycling and vice versa. Um, also, lots of neighborhoods do roadside cleanups across the county, and you're constantly picking up pop cans. And I honestly think if it was 10 cents for a can of soda, uh, that that would change as well, another issue. So that's great to hear it's um, still being talked about. And, and thank you. That's, that's really helpful feedback. The, uh, one of my greatest concerns with producer responsibility that if as municipalities we kick the can over to them and, and, and your comment earlier today in your presentation has me more potentially alarmed. Halberton County's a 4,000 square kilometer uh, box. And uh, if they've drawn the line around the county, if uh, we have the producers look after creating a depot for this, is there any uh, compelling rules or regulations that they would have have to set up uh, any more than just one alone? Uh, yes, the, the servicing needs to match garbage servicing. So if you are servicing garbage at multiple locations, which you are, you're, you're, you're collecting it at multiple depots uh, across the, uh, the county, they would need to provide that same level of service. So they would need to, they would need to include the, the same amount of depots you have operating and collecting waste. Yes, Al. Well, that brings up another interesting uh, scenario because uh, we have been uh, working very hard with our, our neighboring uh, municipalities, the ones that surround Halliburton County with MOUs, uh, memorandums of understanding with regards to what we can or cannot share. Under this program, would we be open to doing that with this kind of a recycling scenario with them? An example that I would bring up from the, count, from the municipality we're in, it might be easier for someone, say for instance in Cardiff, to work with the Bancroft group than it would be to come all the way over and work perhaps with Minda, logistically speaking. And, and today at $2.40 a liter for, for, for fuel, it would make sense to do that. Is that option gonna be available? And uh, sorry, I just want to be clear. So um, in your question, so could producers uh, draw different catchment areas so that part of your county is, is, is actually cut into another, another section of, of the province? Is, is that the specific question? That's correct. It, it would be a neighboring uh, municipality whom we have always had and continue to have uh, shared agreements, especially in waste management. Uh, hazardous waste management and stuff like that. Yes, they could do that. Any other questions? Well, thank you. I, I, I suspect that we'll all have a lot more questions from our staff. And, you know, as we go forward, it's, as I said earlier, it's pretty darn complicated. 
but uh, we appreciate your uh, your being here and bringing us up to date and and we thank you thank you very much for having me uh could i have a mover and a seconder to adopt the minutes of the meeting of may the 11th we we actually have a resolution to receive the, del oh. the uh, delegation here i am just so anxious to move <laughs> forward could i have a mover and a seconder to receive the delegation Councillors Kennedy and Moffat. Moved by Councillor Kennedy, seconded by Councillor Moffat. We have resolved that Halliburton County Committee of the Whole receives for information the June 8, 2022 delegation on Blue Box transition to full producer responsibility from Peter Hargraves on behalf of AMA. All in favor? That's carried. Now, could I have a mover and a second or two to adopt the minutes of May the 11th? This is Rael and Moffat. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Riles, seconded by Councillor Moffat, be it resolved that the minutes from the May 11th, 2022 meeting of Halliburton County Committee of the Whole be adopted as circulated. All in favor? That's carried. And we have no correspondence, so we will move on to the status report for roads. And I suspect we will hear from our uh, Director of Public Works, Mr. Sutton. Good morning. Good morning, Warden. Good morning, Council. Uh, we have our uh, monthly status report. Uh, I could uh, announce that our capital projects are, are progressing well. Uh, we've got about half of them started and about the other half just waiting to start. So we're in good shape this year. Uh, I think we'll um, be in better shape than last year and have uh, most of the work completed, hopefully uh, before the end of the summer, uh, at the end of uh, September. For maintenance, uh, I can let uh, Council know that we have completed all the sweeping, so that's uh, done for the year. So we've got all the roads completed in the county. Uh, just to gain a brief update, and if there's any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Any questions for Mr. Sutton? Hearing none, thank you, Robert. Uh, could I have a mover and a seconder to receive the status report? Councillor DeVolan and Burton. Moved by Councillor DeVolin, seconded by Councillor Burton, be it resolved that the June 2022 status report on capital projects, operations, and road maintenance be received for information by Halliburton County Committee of the Whole. All in favor? That's carried. Uh, nothing under EMS today, so we'll move into finance. Um, Andrea is not available to us today, so I think we will be hearing from Tanya. Good morning, warden and committee members. Good morning. Your first report is the check register. Yes, the check register for May, including all checks, electronic fund transfers, pre-authorized payments totaled $1,639,150.37. Are there any questions on the check register? Hearing none, can I have a mover and a seconder to receive it? Councillors Roberts and Kennedy. Moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Kennedy. Be it resolved that Halliburton County Committee of the Whole receives for information the staff report on the check register for May 2022. Further, that it be recommended to Halliburton County Council that the check register for May 2022 with checks, EFTs, and PAT, PAPs totaling $1,639,150.37 be hereby approved. All in favor? It's carried. Next is your payroll register. The payroll register for May had net direct deposits of $495,822.43, and there were two pays in May. Any questions on the payroll register? Could I have a mover and a seconder to receive the report? Councillor Shell and Ryle. Moved by Councillor Shell, seconded by Councillor Ryle, be it resolved that Halliburton County Committee of the Whole receives for information the staff report on the payroll register for May 2022, that it be recommended to Halliburton County Council that the payroll register for May 2022 with net direct deposits totaling $495,822.43 be hereby approved. All in favor? That's carried. 
And finally, the year-to-date actuals as of May the 31st. As at May 31st, 34.01% of operating expenses have been incurred and 7.06% of capital expenses have been incurred. So five twelfths of the annual budget is equivalent to 41.67%. Any questions on the year to date actuals? Could I have a mover and a seconder to receive that report? Mr. Devolin Moffitt. Moved by Councillor DeVolin, seconded by Councillor Moffat. Be it resolved that the Halliburton County Committee of the Whole receives for information the staff report on the year to date actuals as at May 31st, 2022. And further, that it be recommended to Halliburton County Council that the year to date actuals as at May 31st, 2022 be hereby approved. All in favor? That's carried. Thanks, Tanya. Thank you. Next up is the IT status report. Maybe we'll be hearing from Mr. March. We will. Wonder if I should go down and help him. <laughs> <laughs> Were there, were there any questions on his report? I don't. Uh... Since he's not here, we should come up with a lot of <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, as we seem to be having some IT difficulties, I'd ask for a mover and a seconder to receive the uh, IT report. Councillors Kennedy and DeVolin, thank you. Moved by Councillor Kennedy, second by, by Councillor DeVolin, be it resolved that Halliburton County Committee of the Whole receives for information the June 8th, 2022 IT department status report. All in favor? That's a bit ironic. Um, nothing under planning and environment. And nothing under personnel. So we will uh, we'll now look at... Uh, the tourism reports, and uh, they will be uh, given to us by uh, Scott today. Morning, Scott. Good morning, Warden and members of committee. So tell us about your economic development strategy project. So just uh, the report just is a summary of the responses we received that were qualified. So we did receive four in total, but two didn't meet uh, the cri submission cr criteria and were disqualified. Um, so they outline the cost of both uh, qualified responses, which are fairly similar, um, and ultimately going with the sex and hair up consulting group they've just done more work actually locally with um, recently with our chamber of commerce in Halberton uh, and then I've done some work with Cortha Lakes as well uh, and then below is just outlining lastly I should say is just outlining the process um, and I think importantly just for committee and councils just outlining the the touch points that the consulting group and staff will have with council and committee um, throughout that process so they have ample opportunity to provide input on the product that's being produced and happy to field any questions. Are there any <clears throat> questions? Hearing none, uh, could I have a mover and a seconder to receive that report? Council, Councillor Shell and Councillor Kennedy. Moved by Councillor Shell, seconded by Councillor Kennedy. Be it resolved that Halliburton County Committee of the Whole received the June 8th, 2022 report on the economic development strategy RFP results that it be recommended to Halliburton County Council that staff be directed to proceed with awarding the Economic Development Strategy RFP to Sexton Harrop Consulting Group, and further that the, the fee for the project of $42,300 be funded from Safe Restart Funds. All in favor? That's carried. We really look forward to seeing how this project goes and, uh, and hearing your updates. So uh, tell us about the uh, um, High Caliburton and follow-up information that you've got. 
Uh, thank you, Warden. And, and Tracy does apologize for not being here this morning. She's just providing some training actually to the visitor information centers this morning. But um, so there were just some questions when we presented an update about the fall version of Hike Halliburton, um, just regarding registration, um, how we deal with no shows and any possible opportunities we have to mitigate those. And then lastly, uh, I believe it was uh, Councillor Roberts um, brought up a question about conducting a hike on the rail trail. So we've just provided a summary as to how we um, how we deal with those issues and how we're going to propose to deal with them, as well as um, lastly, just outlining the concept of doing a hike on the rail trail and happy to field any questions related to those. Questions or comments? Councillors Moffat and then Roberts. Um, thank you. Um, Scott, around the, the rail trail hike, um, would there be, would hike leaders be telling stories or sharing history or ghost stories? I mean, what, what would be the, other than walking along the rail trail and seeing uh, the rivers, which is great, uh, even on its own, uh, what would the narrative be? What would make me want to go on that hike that you're going to tell me, teach me, or show me? Um, so through you, Warden, uh, preliminarily, I know Tracy and her team are having some conversations with the rail trail um, committee. Uh, about them participating and being the hike leaders for that and kind of providing a bit of a more interpretive uh, hike on the history of the area. Um, but that's yet to be confirmed. We're just kind of in preliminary discussions on that. Or the friends of the, friends of the rail trail, my apologies. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. So two things. Um, I'm excited to, uh, and I will volunteer to be a sweep or whatever on that hike because I, I it. Um, and I think it'd be great if there is some interpretive stuff, but a lot of people do want to just get from point A to, to point B and you can't, you always have to do a turnaround to get to your vehicle unless you have made arrangements with a friend or something to come pick you up. So I think there, there'll be a lot of interest in this one and um so i so thanks for following up on that suggestion and also i really like you know how you're handling the, the no shows or keeping people's emails sending them a reminder letting them unregister to free up some space it, all of the suggestions that are in your report are excellent so thank you thank you uh and and just to, to close warden if i may um we'll most likely do a summary report perhaps in the fall um, just outline if, if some of these strategies that we've identified have worked, um, and if not, what we would look at doing moving forward. Thank you. That sounds good. Um, question, Councillor Javon? No, just a comment. Uh, thank you. Obviously, lovely to see this coming back in full swing again, and uh, as, uh, uh, as in previous years uh, in Snowden's Park, I've uh, led and sponsored a, a, a mayor's walk in Snowden Park in Minden, that there's some stories about the history of that that are only told on the walk. Uh, so uh, I'd be happy to do that again, if you'd like. Okay, I will let the team know. Any other questions or comments, Councillor Roberts? Oh, and just, just one more thing, Scott, and if uh, the hike is starting at the trailhead in town, um, if you wanted to contact municipal staff uh, to request that the medical center parking be available. I'm not sure, depending on how many people show up for the hike or how many parking spaces you determine at the trailhead, if you need more parking, um, there's parking at the medical center on a, on a Saturday that could be available for free. Okay, I appreciate that. I know uh, Tracy and I think Tom and Eric are actually meeting um, early this afternoon to start um, kind of finalizing some of those details. So I'll let them know that. Thank you. Any other questions? Could I have a mover and a seconder to receive the report on Nahi Caliburn? Councillor Roberts and Shell. Moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Shell. Be it resolved that Halliburton County Committee of the Whole receives the June 8, 2022 report on Hike Halliburton Fall 2022 for information. All in favor? It's carried. Uh, next up is your business voucher program update. Uh, thank you, Warden, and through you. Um, just to follow up again on the report that we brought forward in, in February, and we had lots of discussion um, around the concept of conducting that program and we went and met with our um, local stakeholders and a lot of the questions and comments that 
council had at the time um, were echoed by our by our stakeholders. And although they were greatly appreciative that we were trying to look at creative ways to support them coming out of COVID, um, we feel that's that some of the positive energy that was created through the tourism summit um, has kind of sent us in a, a bit of a different direction. And we'll just look at working with our stakeholders and kind of facilitating partnerships and collaboration um, and product and experience development. Uh, and just to this just closes this um, the project and that we're not going to proceed um, with doing the voucher program this year. Questions or comments? <clears throat> Hearing none, could I have a mover and a seconder to receive that report? Councillors Kennedy and Moffitt. Moved by Councillor Kennedy, seconded by Councillor Moffitt. Be it resolved that Halliburton County Committee of the Whole received the June 8th, 2022 report on the 2022 Business Voucher Program stakeholder feedback for information and that it be recommended to Halliburton County Council that staff do not proceed with the creation of the County of Halliburton Business Voucher Program. All in favor? That's carried. And finally, uh, County Wayfaring. Uh, thank you, Warden, and through you. Um, so it's at one in the port that we, uh, both myself and Tracy, spoke to the Dysart um, Cultural Resources Committee, and, and the topic of wayfinding has come up uh, a few times since I've been here. Um, it's something we've talked about a little bit. It, it, we didn't identify it in our project plan um, for this year, um, but the conversation with the committee expedited that. They forwarded a recommendation to county council. Um, so what we've done is put together um, a report for you, just kind of outlining if council wanted to proceed with directing staff to investigate this further. Um, first and foremost, what that engagement process would look like with the, the townships. Um, and, and then secondarily, um, and again, it's, it's a very um, draft scope as to if the townships wanted to participate, what a potential scope could look like for the project. Um, and then just identifying what we think we could do in-house um, and then what probably would require um, additional support from perhaps a, a third party entity. Um, and happy to field any questions on what we've outlined in the report. Uh, questions or comments, uh, Councillor Roberts and then Councillor Moffat. Thank you. Um, and uh, yes, I attended that uh, committee um, meeting of Horticultural Resource, and this has been talked about at, at Dysart for some time and also talked about at this table. Uh, and so I'm excited that this resolution from Dysart um, has come forward here because I think. Uh, the time is really right for us to do something like this across the county and to have a sort of brand that we can look at that, or, or I should say we, because we live here, but for, for, the, for visitors coming into our community, for clear uh, signage to know where they're going. We've referenced before um, these plans over in uh, Bruce and Huron counties, and I was recently there camping. I actually took a couple pictures, Scott. I meant to email them to you. It doesn't matter. It could be the smallest hamlet, like just a couple hundred people you drive through, and there's uh, a sign with the crest or logo on the top, and it just simply says fairgrounds this way, arena, with an arrow. Um, and, uh, and you know when you're in that county, you know that that's the signage there. So I'm really excited this being brought forward. I think we can do a lot in-house. This is not something that we're, uh, uh, it's not something that hasn't been done in other areas before. Location um, will be a really important factor of where the sign goes. Um, but I think that, that, I do believe that we can do a lot of this in-house. So, thanks. It'd be really good to see consistent signage throughout the county. Uh, the only thing that before I, I go to you, Councillor Moffat, I, I just wonder, and you can all tell me if I'm wrong, if maybe given the timing of things, if, if the order of engagement might change to uh, to meeting with township councils first to, uh, to gather the uh, level of support from the councils and then talk to staff. But uh, that's just a thought that I, that I had. Um, Councillor Moffat and then Councillor Thank you. And that was similar to one of the questions that I had was in the report that say if townships are supportive. And I would I would hope that we wouldn't end up in a situation where um, not all municipalities were on board. This was the primary recommendation from the community exchange program we did a number of years ago. Uh, so this is a long time coming. I'm, I'm really glad to see this uh, and think there's tremendous value in it. Uh, my question 
uh, Scott is around two things is it talks about the county the logo so would the logo be on every every sign or would it depend on the size of the sign and the hierarchy of signage um, I in my experience some kind of logo would probably be on every sign um, the size of that and the design of the the sign I would suggest would depend on the hierarchy as you've outlined. Um, that being said, probably in some of the design phase, um, we're clearly going to want to get some in public input on what that looks like. Um, and we may get feedback that, you know, do you really need a logo on a sign or is it really just more about um, readability, um, it looking consistent across all the townships um, and ultimately just really getting a plan in place that um, the county can, um, you know, look after getting signage where we're responsible and the townships can kind of also proceed at their own, their own pace. And if they want to get it done quicker, they can, and if they want to take more time, but um, I, I would suggest we'd look at that um, when we're gathering input on what the signs would actually look like to get some input from the public and, and ultimately the, the councillors. Councillor Rail. Yeah, this is a, this is a subject that I kind of brought up about three years ago when Highlands East elected to rebrand at that point, and we've standardized a lot of our signs to to the Highlands East logo. Having said that, uh, I don't know why we we could not go to a county wide uh, program that would enable us to to identify the county for sure, and then if if it's up to the individual. Uh, municipalities, if they would like to have secondary branding inside of that. So I think that, uh, that uh, uh, Warden Donaldson's suggestion of going to the individual uh, councils before you do that would be a good idea, because then you'd be able to get the kind of feedback that, that you would need to get the support that I think it deserves in order to get this to work. So uh, I'm, I'm certainly uh, <clears throat> supporting what you're trying to do, but I do believe you'll need uh, support from the municipalities the best way to do that is to contact them directly okay um and if i may just follow up to that word and i just i just want to confirm i'm i'm hearing just from some of the councillors that they think the best course of action would be to meet with the councils first determine the level of buy-in and then um if it's there then meet with staff is that correct and what i'm hearing there yes okay um We'll, we'll go to Councillor DeVolan, and then I believe that uh, Councillor Moffat has a, a follow-up. Well, I'm supportive of it pretty well of anything that we do on a countywide basis, and that should come as no surprise. Uh, certainly, if we can expedite it and have it come to the municipality so that you have wholesale acceptance before we move on, and obviously before uh, some councils become neutered, uh, that if we, as soon as we could do that and then move it forward and It'll show the broad support that I'm sure is across all four municipalities and uh, move on with this. And in the uh, the logos having been a lot of time in a lot of places across the country, there's a lot of them that have the identifiers of the larger group of the county in this context, that with the logo of the, of the uh, municipality at the same time, whether one's bigger or smaller, that sort of thing. But, but there's lots of them that those identifiers are there, that you know that you're in the larger entity, but you also know that there's a, a smaller community contained in this. Uh, great idea. Uh, let's get this done as quickly as we can. Councillor Moffat. Uh, thank you. I, I think this is the proverbial opening of the can of worms, but uh, when we did the community exchange, we, we exchanged into Prince Edward County, and I know they're a very different entity, and they have a very different um, series and set of assets to offer. They have signage that points to almost anything, including small business. And you know, given our conversation earlier about recycling and the vastness of the county, uh, it could certainly be problematic. But one of the ideas that had come from that, realizing that the outcome of the community exchange program is not the, I don't think is the, the leading edge of this, of this idea. Uh, what about smaller businesses uh, that, that are sort of off the beaten path or maybe um, they're not municipal assets? Is that just, too big a bite and so we'll just start with municipal assets and it could grow from there what, what's your thoughts around any of that um the three warden uh the counselors a couple ways 
we can go in, in the past when I did this in a, a, a previous community, we included private enterprise. Um, that does require a higher level of consultation though, because that can get very sensitive. Um, I, I think right now, just for wanting to get this project moving and uh, at least get a, a phase of it completed, um, both Tracy and I have talked about that probably the, the best course of action is just look at municipally owned assets uh, and start there. And then within the plan, we could identify um, for all the townships in the county, a, a policy or process that if a private enterprise wanted to participate um, in the program, there would be um, a clear set of guidelines as to how that would be dealt with. Um, whether it could be they would look after putting the signage. Now, if um, the councils want us to go into in the direction and just say, hey, we want to include all, we want to include private enterprise that we identify as um, tourism assets, we're happy to explore that. Um, it, it just does require a, a lot more public consultation um, uh, and, a, and a bit of a deft touch because it can get very sensitive for people when related to, you know, if this business is on, is identified as an asset and another one isn't. Um, and it's, it's really about identifying what are visitors identifying as a, a countywide or a municipal asset. Did you have a follow-up question, Mr. Moffitt? I, I do. Thank you. And it's, uh, in regard to if municipalities were, and this is a, a municipal conversation, certainly um, not one to be decided here. Uh, for example, Algonquin Highlands doesn't have a sign bylaw. So in order to implement policy around the development of signage for this program, it would make sense for it to live inside an existing sign bylaw. So it's just food for thought that it, we want to get it going quickly, but it may not be, it may not end up being as, as uh, smooth as it appears at the outset. That's all. Um, Mr. Roberts. Um, thank you. Certainly in the area that I visited, uh, going from uh, Grand Bend up to uh, Southampton and in that whole area and those counties up that way, it was only municipal assets. Beach, this direction, Town Hall, this direction. There were no signage for any business. It keeps the signs clean, uh, very easy to read. Um, so, and, and I, I will send those pictures, Scott. I've got a couple in one, in one county has a, a, the, the logo at the top and another one in each municipality. It had the, the name of the village or town. Um, and then like in King Carden, it has, they, they have a tartan. So they have the, the little tartan on their banner at the top. Um, so I'd be in support of just looking at municipal assets only at this point, a beach as an example or rec center. Um, I think presenting to town councils first, staff are included, and then those councils can direct their staff in a resolution to create a working group and appoint a staff member at that point. You know, each we all have different uh, staff complements at each municipality. So I think coming to council, staff are present in council, and that would get the ball rolling in the, in the right way. Councilor Real. Yes, yeah, Scott, when you were talking about private sector, uh, when we were doing ours, we, we made the decision of going with the municipal signage first. Our intention was to then look at uh, signage for directional to other sources, mostly on our multiple um, multi-purpose trails. So that if you're in the back bush and you wanna know where gasoline is or you want anything like that, um, that was to be in phase two. Unfortunately, uh, COVID came in and we kind of sort of brought that to to a halt at the moment, but I think in, 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 in if we're going to do this, I think those kind of generic signs for, for private sector might be a great phase two, but I, I totally agree that in phase one, we should make sure that people know where they're going within the municipal uh, uh, jurisdictions. Uh, thank you, and we can, um, when we're kind of building that plan out, we can keep that in mind about looking that at, at phase two, and I'm, I'm always careful of referencing Huntsville just because I know we, we don't want to be Muskoka, but um, they're, you know, they referenced Deerhurst when it came to like a, a private sector enterprise or really talking about something or known, but 
we can, I, I think that's right to maybe look at that as a phase two and it can be identified in the plan. And then again, um, it's about getting policies and, and processes in place just to streamline that if, if a council's approached, um, whether that's at the lower tier or the upper tier, um, about how we would deal with that. Um, and then maybe just a quick follow-up to Councillor Moffitt is, um, we could look at even in the scope of work of having a sign by law built into this, if, if that is going to maybe expedite um, some of the process again and, and make it a little, um, a little bit smoother sailing for some of the townships. So those are um, things we can keep in mind as we're presenting to the township uh, councils. Any other questions or comments? Well, thanks, Scott. Uh, could I have a mover? You've got a follow-up question? Only just comment, there is a county sign by law. Uh, I think th there's a county sign by law, and probably each mm -hmm. of the lower tiers have their own sign by laws as well as... Or some don't. Some do, some don't. But there is a county sign by law. If I... Uh, yeah, I wasn't... I wasn't saying... Thank you. But <laughs> if Algonquin Highlands wants to put a sign by law in place, it could do so and has the staff to do it and could... Yep. Um, along the way. Could I have a mover and a seconder then to receive the wayfaring report to uh, Councillors Royale and DeBullen? Uh, moved by Councillor Royale, seconded by Councillor DeBullen. Be it resolved that Halliburton County Committee of the Whole received the June 8, 2022 report county wayfinding plan for information and that it be recommended to Halliburton County Council that staff be directed to engage with township councils and staff to determine the feasibility of creating a countywide wayfinding plan Further, that staff be directed to report back to County Council with recommended next steps. All in favor? That's carried. Thanks very much, Scott. I don't believe there's any new items of business. I think we'll be having a fulsome conversation about municipal collaboration this afternoon. Uh, so I would uh, look to a mover in a second or two go into closed. Moved by Councillor Shell and Moffat. Moved by Councillor Shell, seconded by Councillor Moffat, be resolved that Halliburton County Committee of the Whole enter into closed session for the following reasons. Personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees. All in favor? That's carried. Oh, sorry. Welcome back to the open session. Um, with uh, nothing less to left to do, could I ask for a mover and a seconder to adjourn the open session? Councillors Kennedy and Burton. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Kennedy, seconded by Councillor Burton. Be it resolved that the June eighth, two thousand twenty-two meeting of Halliburton County Committee of the Whole now adjourn. All in favor? We stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Board. Well, we shall. We'll